Uh, very good. Um, welcome, everybody. Good, good to see you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the presentation. We held an event at the House of Commons in November, and uh, we're talking about how we see heat decarbonising, particularly in houses uh, across the UK. We've, we've got other plans for non-domestic buildings, but this, this vision was about houses. And it was great to see the the results of your, uh, your your workshop from last year, which uh, a lot of it, I think, synchronizes really well. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to pick up some of that today and look through. So um, first of all, we have got to stop burning fossil fuels, just full stop. It's not, not going to be compatible with net zero. And home heating at the moment, or heating and hot water together is around 21%, or a bit more than a fifth of all of our CO2 emissions. Uh, a lot of uh, friends of mine are really surprised to find out that their, their gas boiler uh, gives out more CO2 than their car. Most people are quite familiar with cars being uh, uh, kicking out, out pollution and uh, surprised actually when, when their homes do as well. And heat pumps are the likely for running technology at the moment. And that's what we specialise with at Kenza. And in particular, we specialise with ground source heat pumps. And a lot of the stuff coming out of Northern Ireland refers to geothermal. We quite often refer to ground source. Today, I'm gonna to just use those terms interchangeably. Um, there is a technical distinction. Geothermal often is meant uh, for, for heat coming from much deeper, you know, deeper than 500 meters, whereas ground source is often used for um, near the surface. But if you go to America, they're both called geothermal and you know, we're, we're not too fussy um, how you switch them. And most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about is applicable to both anyway. So, so we'll, we'll work through that. Um, how do they work with the ground source? Um, mostly, particularly shallow, shallow ground source, so down to about 500 meters. The ultimate source of energy is from the sun. And uh, the average temperature, once you get about 10 meters below ground, is the average temperature of the air above that ground. So it's great because it's warmer than the, uh, than the air in the winter and it's cooler than the air in the summer and it sits just at that average temperature so you've actually got a great source of heating and cooling and as uh, as Yorkshire Doug there um, is showing you you take energy from the ground and it goes into a box inside your your building um, which is called a heat pump and that turns that into usable energy so normally coming up from the ground 10 11 12 degrees getting amplified, compressed, squished by the heat pump and set out to the heating system at anything from 35 to 55 degrees. That's how it works. So where are we doing this now? We are doing buildings in these main categories, so private homes, and that's where Kenza started, a lot of self-builds, but also retrofit, large non-domestic buildings, new builds and social housing. So that's a that's the kind of today of ground source. I have to say most people, if you picture uh, ground source and particularly sometimes when we're even speaking to government, we'll picture the one on the left. So one borehole or one horizontal array with one heat pump and one home. But actually that doesn't really reflect the reality of what we're doing, which is uh, much more in those other three categories right now. So in the first category are private homes, uh, looks just like, like these sort of things. And you'll notice, uh, the last one here, that's that's stretching it a little bit to call it a private home. It's not actually a private home anymore. It used to be, believe it or not. It's uh, now uh, owned by the National Trust. It's Trillisic House in Cornwall. And yeah, even, even more than a private home, that was just their holiday home, <laughs> the family that had it before they gifted it to the National Trust. But the really interesting thing about this one is, as you can imagine, with a National Trust owned uh, listed building, there's no real opportunity to upgrade the fabric in that building. And yet that is heated perfectly well with a ground source heat pump today and uh, to some reasonably tight specifications because you've got to keep all the artwork at set temperatures, et cetera. So it, it, one of the things we can do, a little bit of myth busting uh, that you have to have a perfectly, incredibly well insulated, almost a passive house before you'd even think about a heat pump. That's uh, spectacularly not true. And that building is an example. The building I'm in, which is my house at the moment, you can see behind me, that's not fake office. That's not a backdrop. That is my actual wall. And that is a uh, granite uninsulated wall. And here I am in February, nice and warm, whilst heated by a ground source. So it is perfectly possible. You do have to uh, think a little bit more about the design and uh, 
in older buildings that aren't so well insulated, but it's perfectly possible. We're also doing a lot of non-domestic buildings. So you see a university there in Plymouth, a large kind of council depot, and then that's a leisure centre in Northumberland. So uh, across the country, we're doing uh, those non-domestic buildings. Social house, sorry, new builds. And new builds are, are, are great for us because we get to do quite a lot of homes at the same time in the same place. But particularly when you're, when you're doing uh, vertical drilling, it actually costs quite a, a bit of time and effort to get all the kits set up and even before you can start drilling, sometimes a day or two, and you, you might be drilling on the, the end of the second day or the third day even. And then if you only have to drill one short borehole, you might be finished and gone and then spend two days getting unpacked. So, so doing a lot in one place at one time is really useful. So those large non-domestic buildings we're looking at need a lot of heat. Therefore, you end up doing a lot of drilling and, and you spread out that setup cost and, uh, and the mobilization over lots of boreholes and it brings the cost down. Same in new build, if someone's building a hundred homes, there's a decision made about when those homes are going to be, how they're going to be heated, and you can put the infrastructure in and, and fit them all at the same time. In the new build, we normally share the ground array. So you might up, end up with one borehole for roughly every two or three homes. And that also brings down uh, uh, the cost through efficiency. So it, it's actually cheaper and quicker to drill fewer boreholes that are deeper than it is lots and lots of shallow ones across the site because of the, the time and effort splint moving and, and getting prepped. Um, so yeah, that, that theme, lots of lots of ground source, lots of heat demand at the same time and in the same place. And by the same logic, social housing uh, has been a really good market for us as well, because you see a tower, tower blocks there. If you're doing the whole tower block in one go, then you can turn up with your drill rig, put all of the infrastructure in for all of those apartments at the same time and because they're owned by one entity the local authority or the housing association they can make that uh, that decision to ha have them all treated at the same time i'm not i'm not quite going to represent that it's a single decision maker normally uh, for a project like this that's that's there in uh, east london in thurrock um takes several months and has to go through all the different departments but at the end of it uh, you can uh, schedule that project to all happen in one time so that's a little taste of what we're doing now and uh, it's going reasonably well with Kenza. We're, we're up to around uh, just under half of the UK's ground source um, is being supplied by Kenza now, and that's coming out of our factory in Cornwall. And uh, we've got the three, three arms of the business that are, that are delivering that. So uh, Kenza, this is Kenza Contracting's type of work, the non-domestic buildings there, plus the uh, new build on the tower blocks. Um, but people, people wanting them for their own home can still order them and, and get them in. So where are we going? So we talked about a vision. Um, that's all great. This, this is what we're actually doing. So now let's have a little talk about where we're going. Uh, it's fair to say the mass retrofit for low carbon heating hasn't even started yet anywhere in the UK. It's not many countries have started at all, but in the UK, almost none. So if you picture all the cities on the gas grid, all the terrace houses, they're just not being done by any technology really right now. And we are going to have to ramp up pretty soon. We've got to get all of them done by 2050. In the UK, that's 24 million homes on gas and another 5 million or so that aren't. So we're going to have to go faster than a million pounds a year across the, a million homes a year uh, across the UK to, to get them done. So currently running at 40, 50,000. You can see it's going to take us a really long time to get there unless we ramp up. So um, th this, is, this is the way we think. Um, a lot of the homes in the UK can go, and that's as applicable in Northern Ireland as it is uh, in any other part of the UK. So this is a street in Bristol I'm going to use as an illustration of the challenge we face first. Uh, it's actually called Green Street, which is pretty ironic when you look at it, uh, that all of the cars are internal combustion engine, petrol and diesel. There's no trees at all in the street, or there's one little, little um, palm tree there in someone's garden it looks like a, a, a sprout and there's a couple of weeds um, all of the, the heating is gas boilers and there's there's no real um, front runner for how we're going to decarbonize these streets uh, a lot of people think we might go air source heat pumps well looking at the street you're supposed to ideally get seven meters away from your neighbors with an air source heat pump the width of those buildings is around seven meters. So straight away, you can see that it's going to be tricky. There might be space at the back of the buildings. 
uh, but you've got to get through through the building out to the back and then you'll have all sorts of extensions and you'll, you'll end up with the same proximity issue. So we think that's a, that's a real challenge to be able to put a, an S or solution into a street like this. You might decide to just convert the street from natural grass, gas over to hydrogen. Uh, we think that poses a huge amount of challenges. A, logistically, every single property would have to change over on the same day for a start. All of the pipe work in the street is unlikely, it might be, if it's been recently uh, uh, replaced, it might be compatible with hydrogen, but it's most likely not. But certainly all the pipes between the main street and the boilers won't, won't be, and then you've got to change the boiler, and then ideally you, you want to try and get the heating system set up so that it actually condenses and uses less fuel. So if you manage to do all of that and coordinate all the timings, the fuel then is still going to be quite a bit more expensive than gas. So e even if you can manage the, the logistics, um, it's still going to be a real challenge to try and uh, give effective heating in these sort of buildings. So we already know that ground source can, can give you really competitive running costs with gas and, and often a little, a little bit cheaper. So we think the, the switch over to hydrogen is going to be going to be an incredible challenge. You could look at uh, traditional central plant district heating and you know, you could get a, a, a low carbon energy source for that. But with these sort of streets, it actually is quite difficult to, to make a good business case for it. So all, all high temperature district heating loses some heat to the environment. And if you're in an area where you need a lot of heat and you're delivering a, a lot of energy, then those losses are really small and they're, they're perfectly acceptable within the, uh, in the business plan. When you go to areas like this that have a low heat density, you end up with a lot of pipe and a small amount of heat being delivered, and the, the losses can start to get to be a, a really large proportion of what you're supplying in there. And you picture these streets in the summer, you might only use half an hour at mo most worth of hot water usage in, in these buildings, and yet you've got to circulate heat uh, 24 hours a day to get that. So we think that the heat density in these buildings is not that good for central plant district heating. So it does beg the question, what are we, what are we suggesting? And just, just to be sure uh, that uh, Bristol is not the only place this is in London. So when we were at the House of Commons, uh, it was quite fun to show this because it was only two, two miles away from the House of Commons. Um, it's called Green Street. It's a bit posher than the one in Bristol, hand on heart, but it's got exactly the same problems. Not all combustion engine cars, all uh, gas heating and no trees on the street. You can actually just about see Hyde Park at the end of it, which has got some trees, but uh, the street itself's not, not really got any. And if we go a little bit of a tour around the UK's green streets, that's Cardiff, not quite so posh as uh, Mayfair, but uh, same problems, same decarbonisation challenges. This is Liverpool and this is Glasgow. So the Glasgow one actually was interesting because for COP26, we put together a, a, a set of animations and. Um, we've got a nice little app that you can you can go through and see how we would decarbonize that street. So we went to, to COP26 and presented that uh, when that was on, and you can follow that with that uh, Welcome to Green Street. So our vision for the future um, is 21st century equivalent of the gas grid. So although it is ground source, it is a heat pump solution, we want to try and make it look, feel, and the experience of it as close to what people are used to with gas as you possibly can. So the concept here is uh, in a gas situation, utility companies come along and put the infrastructure in the street. You then have a white box in your home. And when you want to be warm, you turn the thermostat up, your white box fires up, you pay for the fuel that your box consumes, and then you pay for a standing charge for access to the infrastructure in the street. And so you've got this low energy, um, low grade energy being delivered, chemical energy in terms of gas. Our view, you do almost exactly the same thing, but instead your low grade energy being delivered by the infrastructure is low grade heat rather than chemical energy. You have a, you have a white box, a slightly different white box, um, but you still turn it on when you want to be warm. And the heat pump, the white box in this case, uses electricity rather than burning gas. You pay for the fuel that it uses, the electricity, and then you pay a standing charge for access to the ground array. So historically, most people have liked ground source and, and geothermal, and the, the efficiencies are there, the technology is very easy to live with, but it's, it can be quite expensive, particularly the bit you put in the ground. Um, the, 
the bit that you put in the ground del delivers energy for a hundred years. So in a roundabout way, you're buying a hundred years worth of energy in one go when you put that infrastructure in. So you know, if, if a borehole um, costs, let's say 5,000 pounds, that's often been considered as a cost. But translating that over a hundred years, it's only 50 pounds a year. So if we can take that cost and turn it into an asset, and then do it on a scale that uh, utility type investments can get involved, then you can flip that whole thing on its head. And, and it's actually, that's exactly how we converted to the gas network in the first place. So all of those buildings would have had coal fires originally. And then in the 50s and 60s, gas networks were put into the street. Number, number seven connects, number 33 connects, and people connect gradually by gradually Onto, onto the system. And we think we can do exactly the same here, put all the infrastructure in and then connect the property by property and switch over. And, and that way you, you can phase it, you can you can time it through, you get, you get away from all of those, uh, everybody switch over on the same day type issues. And uh, you can put the costly bit and finance it over a nice long time that, that people pay through a simple standing charge. That's what it looks like on a city scale. So you, you might have tiny buildings here and apartments that have got a small heat load and therefore a small heat pump. And larger buildings might have a domestic size heat pump. And you might have something like a supermarket or office blocks that have got a commercial grade heat pump. So the network of pipe work together is sharing all of that energy and all turning on and on off at slightly different times. And they each have a heat pump that's perfectly suited to their own environment. So some of these might run at, um, 35 degrees if you've got underfloor heating. These ones might be on radiators at 50 degrees, and you might be doing hot water somewhere else at 60 degrees. But you don't have to run the whole network at the higher temperature needed for the worst room in the worst building of the whole network. You run them at somewhere between zero and 20 Celsius, and then the heat pumps do all the upgrading and downgrading inside the thermal envelope of the building. Even better than that, they're connected to the building's electric supply, so there's no there's no central um, billing mechanisms or plants. You just uh, or, or measurements or pumping or infrastructure. Just if this heat pump turns on, its pump turns on. It, it exchanges energy with the network, and it works that way. You can do cooling off the same network. So just as 10 degrees is a great temperature to, as an input into a heat pump to, to to do heating, it's also a fantastic temperature as an input into a, a heat pump for cooling. So you, you think of a supermarket now, all summer long, is trying to take cold out for all its freezers and fridges out of 25, 30 degree air. And all winter long, it's trying to heat some of the areas out of air that's, you know, zero, two, three, four, five degrees. And yet with a, with a network like this, it's taking uh, all of the heating and the cooling from that mid temperature. Even better than that, the, the waste product of doing cooling is heat. The heat then goes back into the network. So you might have a supermarket here cooling for all its uh, fridges, sending the heat into the network. Somebody over here might be running their heating or hot water, and both systems are more efficient. So the, the energy used for cooling is lower, and the energy used for heating and hot water is lower by sharing and recycling that energy around the system. There's loads of other sources of waste heat. I've named a few here. We're data centers are a, a, a classic one that, uh, that a lot of people are getting excited about. They really do use a huge amount of energy. All of that energy running the servers ends up as heat and there is an engineering problem to get rid of. So if you happen to, to want to have uses of heat near, near a data center, then there's great opportunity. We're really excited about cooling of solar PV panels. Uh, solar PV panels actually like to be cold they produce more energy the colder they are and you take that heat off the back of them putting it into the network so the heat pumps will use less energy so you've got this great great synergy between generating more and using less when if you chill uh, pv panels all right how does this all fit into northern Ireland? that's the kind of general generic picture across um, any any part of the uk and any city um, northern Ireland specifically um, joe mentioned the uh, the net zero pathway and the workshop you were having having there earlier uh, it's going to be slightly different depending on where you are in northern ireland um northern Ireland is a little bit different from the uk in the way the homes are heated right now so across the uk 85 percent of homes have gas central heating and only less than four percent are on oil in northern ireland less than a quarter have access to gas to start with 
and uh, more than two thirds uh, are stuck with home heating oil, which is more expensive and higher carbon. So it's a bigger challenge uh, in Northern Ireland. There's bigger benefits when you switch to a low carbon, low running cost heating system, you do get a bigger percentage savings. So as much as it's a challenge right now, there is it does create that, um, that opportunity to, to decarbonize. Um, similar here in Cornwall, we have less than half of Cornwall is uh, is connected to the gas grid. So um, Northern Ireland's even even more extreme than that, but certainly recognise the challenges. If you go right into the centre of Belfast, uh, then you are likely to be getting towards the sort of heat densities where a central plant district heating makes sense. Um, so. This is, I couldn't find a heat map of Belfast anywhere. I tried and tried, I searched and searched for it. This one is Bristol and it's generally accepted at, at above around 4,000, this is kilowatt hours uh, per meter per year. Then central plant district heating is financially viable. So you can see that's the very center there, plus probably just about viable in, in some of the areas around. Most of Bristol you can see uh, it is kind of falling below that threshold and would be much better suited to the sort of networked heat pumps model we were just looking at. A similar is true in, in Belfast, uh, where that central area is, is likely to be suited. And some of the things that we would be thinking about is similar to, to they've got in Glasgow, and this is Queen's Quay, where they're taking uh, heat from the River Clyde and feeding it into a district heating system. And in Belfast, you've obviously got the Lagan, you've got a, a, a shallow-ish aquifer right underneath the city. So you've got two great sources of energy for a, for a central plant district heating scheme right there in Belfast. And then you can do the traditional closed loop boreholes. And there are lots of opportunities for, for waste heat from shops, data centers, offices, et cetera. So um, that's probably not the the, the bit that, uh, that we've been talking about for, uh, from Kenza's um, network heat pumps vision, um, but that is a, a good option in the centre. But really, that's just the central part of, of Belfast. And um, for most of the other towns and cities across Northern Ireland, and even most of the outskirts of Belfast, we'll probably be looking at some sort of ambient solution. Really, uh, disappointingly, Belfast doesn't have a green street, but great, it does have a green ore street. So yeah, if we managed to get into the, uh, the set of photos, um, I did also find a, a green Green Lane and a Green Crescent as well, um, but Green Ore Street, here we are, this is in South Belfast. And you can see, starting to see a pretty familiar picture now uh, across the UK, terraced homes, um, relatively low heat density, all on gas, and uh, using the street as both the source and the distribution of energy into streets like this, uh, we think is the way, way to go and something we're, we're pretty keen to do. We think it fits in with all of the um, outputs from uh, Northern Ireland Geothermal Week and uh, the round tables you had there. So uh, it's clearly customer focused. If you're living in a, a building connected to a networked heat pumps system outside, then you can choose your heat pump, you can choose your installer, and you can choose who supplies your electricity. So it's as close to the gas system as we, we have now. You don't really choose whether you've got gas in your street or not, but you do get to choose your boiler, your plumber and your and your gas supplier. And so we, we're maintaining that element of customer uh, choice. You, you get a really low running cost system that's uh, low maintenance, low servicing, long lasting and operates in pretty much the same way as your gas system. So you end up paying the same standing charge, paying a similar amount for fuel. So it's a, it's an, it's a low um, mental leap change to, to low carbon systems, heating systems. Communities are, are pretty clear. You've got to do this community based. You try to do this one house at a time, it's gonna be all but impossible. Whereas if you come across and, uh, and do the whole street in one go, exactly as we see for the non-domestic buildings, new builds and social housing retrofit, you can bring down the costs and communities working together have a much faster way of doing this. Uh, clear environmental benefits, every property decarbonized like this gives you a 70% drop in carbon emissions, and then that will continue to drop as you add low carbon electricity onto the grid. So 70% on day one, and a really clear, easy route to net zero without having to go back to the building. Uh, people and jobs and skills, uh, this sort of work has to be done by the people in that community. So your um, 
hopefully, I know you've got one of the big ambitions is to build up a, a drilling supply chain in Northern Ireland. The, the drill legs physically have to be there. You can't you can't package up a borehole from from the Far East and uh, and ship it over uh, to to Northern Ireland and have it just appear in the road. You have to actually uh, turn up there physically with a drill rig and people to operate it. And the same with installing the heat pump. So it, it likely to be the same uh, workforce that's installing gas boilers and oil boilers now. Um, it's a relatively quick transition across, um, particularly when you just have to plug the heat pump into the network. So most people fitting gas don't design gas grids, and we don't we don't think people fitting ground source heat pumps should have to design the whole network. They just they just need to plug into it and check they're getting the heat. Um, it also brings investment. We see this being financed mostly privately, and so all of that infrastructure going in the street being paid for as an institutional investment, exactly the same way as the gas network was paid for privately initially. I know National Grid in the UK did, did take that over in the, in the late 60s and, and nationalise it, but it but it all got put into the towns initially by, uh, by private investment. Uh, it was likely to need some government subsidy um, uh, initially, and uh, we're aiming in, within Kenza to make it financially viable without subsidy by 2028. So we've given ourselves five, five years to, to make that happen bring down the costs up the efficiency, bring down the cost of capital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we've, we've got a 15 point plan to do that and uh, hopefully do that within the next five years. But but either way, we see this as bringing investment into uh, the communities. Obviously in the UK, leveling up is the huge agenda buzzword at the minute. And this does create uh, inward investment into, into the wherever, whatever area it's put in. So yeah, we think this is a, a great fit with, uh, with that vision and uh, look forward to the rolling out across the UK, including Northern Ireland. <laughs>